This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Four minutes past nine is the time on LBC. Welcome to the programme if you've just tuned in. Um, I get... I do read the emails that come into the programme. You probably think I don't, but I do. It's what I, I, how I spend my hour going home of an evening reading all the emails that have come in. And um, people often email me with ideas for discussion on the programme. And the next hour is a, as a result of one of those emails. The email came in from uh, Kerry Menai Davis, whose son Hugh died almost exactly two years ago, aged six, from a rare form of cancer. And this was quite a few weeks ago now. And he told me that a bill was about to be introduced into Parliament by Sir Oliver Heald, who's his MP, and it, it was going to help parents who were in the situation that Hugh and his wife found themselves in uh, two, two, well, two or three years ago. And rather than me explain what what happened to them, what happened to Hugh, um, I've got Kerry with me in the studio and Sir Oliver Heald is here too. And they're, they're, they're going to be here for the whole hour. And what I want to do is to explore the pressures that parents come under when they're looking after children who have very severe illnesses, maybe long-term illnesses, maybe illnesses that inevitably result in, in death. And just the psychological pressures are bad enough, but when effectively the rest of your life has to be put on hold because you are literally caring for your child 24 hours a day, I think those of us that have never been through anything like this can't quite imagine how terrible it must be. But particularly if you have other children, just to keep keep your life just to have some semblance of normality in your life in this situation must be hard enough without worrying about where the next penny is coming from. So I want to hear from if you've been in that situation and um, maybe you, you, you can relate to what Kerry is about to tell us. Um, now, just take us through your, your story, which I know is probably going to be quite emotional for everybody. Yep. Um, and to take us through sort of from where it started to why we're all sitting here in the studio today. Yeah, of course. I'm not, thanks for having me. Um, so, October 2020, uh, Hugh was a uh, five-year-old, um, jumping around the house through COVID, and went back to school for the six weeks in that term, um, come to October half-term, um, slightly off his food. Do you know, nothing that you put out of the ordinary for someone going back to school, tired, we put it down to. Um, didn't really say much, but uh, Hugh was as live as they come as a five-year-old, as perfect as you can get. Um, had the best upbringing. We did everything we thought was right. Um, breastfed, uh, nice holidays, everything you could do on paper as a blueprint to raise a healthy child. And we did. And um, out of nowhere, he said he was having a, a pain in his tummy. And then one, I remember the Thursday, I think the 21st, 22nd of October it was in 2020, he just he sat in the bath. And I remember looking at my wife and his tummy was completely distended. And, you know, as a, a paranoid dad anyway, he's got slight hypochondria, as my wife might say. Um, you just say, I oh, don't take him to hospital. I, 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 you don't want to hear COVID and things. Everything was around the hospital. But my wife had mother's intuition and, and took him into hospital. And in the space of seven days, she was diagnosed with, well, he was diagnosed with cancer within 24 hours. And then on Halloween, he started chemotherapy um, from nowhere. And, he, and about a week before, he was fine playing golf with me. And I've got videos on my phone for it. And then during that 10-month period with Hugh, he had a, um, a rare soft tissue cancer called rhabdomyosarcoma, um, which I've never heard of before, and I never Googled it once whilst he was being treated for it. He had six months of a really intensive um, chemotherapy, which involved us staying in hospital for sort of three nights at a time every three weeks, plus... You know, people don't really know so much about what goes on with childhood cancer. Fortunately, um, you're always on call uh, with temperature checking every two hours in the house. Like anything 38 degrees and above, you're straight into A&E for um, uh, antibiotics to start, which means you're in for two days at a time. How often did that happen? Uh, well, fortunately, in some respects, COVID was at the right time for us for when he got diagnosed because people were looking after themselves. They were washing their hands and wearing face masks. So, And we hid away, um, like socially. We never saw anyone. I hid it. Well, we just stayed in our house. Um, so but impact, uh, more socially it impacted us. And obviously you're scared. No one knew what COVID was doing with children and chemotherapy at the time. 
Um, and we were fortunate we got our jabs in January, which opened us up a little bit to get out. But Hugh Breeze, he rang the bell in on the May 23rd, 2021, you know, and you think you're winning, and the bell is a massive significance for any parent. It was something that we all aimed for. Just explain that, because people may not be yeah, familiar so, with that um, tradition. One of the things is in the Children's Council, which is if anyone needs a humble experience in life, is go into one of those wards, um, because problems don't seem real until you walk into that ward. Um, and I, I can remember the day I walked in, I thought, well, I, do you know what, I thought I had problems, and obviously we're now in this. Um, and you walk past the bell, and the bell is donated by charity on the wall, and it's to mark a not end the treatment, but a significant milestone in the treatment for the move from him. So the aim was that Hugh would have finished his six months of intensive chemotherapy and radiotherapy. He rang the bell, and then from that moment you think you're winning, sort of. And um, many, or well, most kids do win in that sense. But unfortunately, Hugh went on to a maintenance therapy. Radiotherapy kind of blew him apart a little bit in the sense that it just really reduced his immune system and. Um, and he made his sixth birthday on the 30th of August, um, which was um, nice because it's the first time he's actually played with his friend on the 29th since COVID really got diagnosed, which is lovely. And on the 30th, it's the first time all the family came around the house since he got diagnosed. And then sadly, um, the day he was supposed to start school in 2021, he relapsed and he passed away on the 18th of September um, in 2021, um, just turning six. And two weeks that in that hospital time where my wife and I were in there, literally in a room with him for, for two weeks, sort of set like a fire off in us really. And um, always said I was gonna do something after, cause everyone doesn't, I mean, you've recently experienced it with your hip. You don't realize what the NHS does until you really need it and where the money goes. And charities prop everything up as in care and things for parents. And we were hidden away from all that because um, of COVID. And always said I'm gonna do something, but you know, I said to my wife, we need to do something. So afterwards we set up a charity and the first words my wife spoke to me when Hugh was diagnosed and, you know, you always think it's someone else, it's never you. So we set up the charity, It's Never You, which was aiming to support the parents of children with cancer because we just felt we were totally isolated and mm. no one can understand or relate to what we're going through unless you're going through it. And it's very hard during that time of COVID, you lock yourself away and there's parents in hostel for two, three months at a time and... Um, and also, out of grief, really, I try to immerse myself in something that could help others. You know, you don't really... You just find that a sense of helping others kind of helps you. And so, yeah, we set the charity up, and then, um, you know, I did stupid things like run the marathon just before his funeral. I did that. We raised nearly £40,000 for a kid's charity and just immersed myself in some physical activities. And then I got on to Sir Oliver Hield's uh, emails um, saying we need a change. And I think the first one we spoke to about was bereavement care because I felt there was a lacking in bereavement care for my wife and I. And especially as a, uh, a male trying to reach out to say, look, I actually need help. And I, I, I mentioned that I need help to everyone. I've got my wife to look after. I've got her family, my family, Hugh's friends at school, their parents, everyone's asking me. And no one really expects like, a child to pass away at that age. Yeah. So I reached out and um, there was nothing there that I could find. So we set the charity up. I created and built um, a platform with, um, called the Children's Cancer Platform, which is an app. So we're in every hospital in the UK at the moment, up and down in Children's Cancer World. So Great Ormond Street, Addingbrooks, where Hugh was, um, Manchester, Birmingham, where parents all over the country using it um, to try and connect them all together so they can talk to each other and share their stories. Because um, one of the things that we found is it's a shared care experience between the parent and the hospital. Obviously, the doctors can tell you certain things, but they don't know what's going on at home. And the only people that can tell you that are people that have walked in your shoes before. So that's what we wanted to do was speak to people. And there's a whole like array of emotions and mental problems and everything that goes on with looking after a sick child. We went through it for 10 months and obviously we came out the wrong side of it. I, I, I fully expected to be here and Hugh to be here for the rest of his life with me. It wasn't the order that it was meant to be. Um, and I said to my wife, um, as I put out a post today, I said, look, following the hearse um, and Hugh's funeral, I just said to like, we've got to make a change now for in his legacy. So, yeah, that's what we did. Um, and I was on Sir Oliver Hill's case straight away. How long before he died did you know that he well, was I, going to die? Uh, I bought his school uniform to go back to school with on the 6th of September. So I had him planned to go back to school. We went in for meetings at the school. Um, to take him back in Heathmount, um, to take him back there. And he relapsed on the day that he was supposed to go back into school. And I remember I spoke to the headmaster yesterday. Um, he asked me how I am. 
they're always so, so amazing squad. They've really looked after us well. Looked after um, Hugh's younger brother Rafe amazingly well. And um, I just said to him, I remember the phone call about two years ago today that I made to you to say that Hugh wasn't coming back. And um, it's those kind of things that you know it never goes away. Um, it's a scar that never heals. But it's just if you can put purpose into your pain into purpose, then that's what we're doing. And hopefully, what we're going to do now with this bill is make a change that will help the parents that we were and obviously still are from the other side of it but I, we speak to loads of parents every day that through the charity and we can hear firsthand the struggles that they have and do you know I don't envy them I've been there and do you know it's very hard to say but I just you put yourself back into that and I just remember the constant anguish and pain and even as much pain as I'm in now but mm. um, but you yeah you just try and find ways and to do, do you find that you're, you're sort of almost having to put up a, a brave front. I mean, to do this sort of thing, I mean, it can't be easy to have spent the last 10 minutes. Do you know... But, but um, you've done it incredibly it's brilliantly. It's apparent, like, it's one of those things that helped me get through the darkest time, like, after it. I said, uh, those who know me well know that I'm 100 miles an hour, as you can probably tell, I haven't shut up for the last <laughs> 10 minutes. But uh, It's radio, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 we wanted to do something, and I, I find it, yeah, it's hard, but... You think why you're doing it in the first place, and it's harder yeah. on the children. I mean, I, I've, I've never seen um, kids fight and battle so hard as I watched Hugh thing, and I, f I just, if that was me, I don't know if I'd have the fight to do what he did. And um, you think, well, the pain and the anguish and the stress and the, the, what they fight those kids is nothing to what I'm dealing with now. Mm. So, and, and uh, it's, it's a sort of very private thing in in some ways as you as you're going through it, experiencing it all, but. You clearly felt that you didn't feel, certainly in the aftermath, there was much support. But while this was all going on, what was there any support that well, you had, apart uh, from family and friends? No, no, on the first instance on diagnosis, you're bombarded quite quickly with, let's say, the Cancer 101, basically. You're you're sitting then there with your son, you don't know what's going on, and they're um, telling you everything, and it's almost like a whirlwind. And then how I relate to it is like if you're on a, an aeroplane at 36,000 feet and you're trying to someone's give you pride and prejudice to read and the plane's bouncing around there's no way you'll be able to concentrate so when they're telling you all this stuff you could never concentrate and there wasn't much of it because obviously we were going through a pandemic at the time and even now as we know it's more stretched now um and I remember saying to my dad as I was coming home do you know there's no food in the hospital for us there's no I'm a, I'm, I'm a big guy and Obviously, the child is the first point of care for the hospital. So quite right, they're the ones that are going through it all. But like I said, it's a shared experience. Like, you need the parents strong. And one of the analogies I've used many a time is, like, if you're on an aeroplane, what's the captain say? He said, put your air mask on, your oxygen mask, but put yours on first before you can help someone else. So that's the same as the parent. They need to look after themselves. Mm. And we were sat there in the hospital, and you'd have the nutritionists, and you'd have the, the, the doctors and the consultants quite right looking at the child, but they never say, how are you eating? How are you coping? Are you sleeping all right? Because like, sleep's a major thing, especially when you're so stressed, but you can't sleep because you're anxious. So there was never really anything that could um, help us in that sense. And to be fair, some parents want to shut away from it. It's a nightmare that's ongoing. But, and some of the time, with chronic illnesses, it goes on for years and, and for all the, their lives, really. But it's never really... Um, well, we never felt we was, it was it was touched upon or or people wanted to talk about it. And then, so, yeah, that's... We, we, we thought and we spoke about it. I just thought there needs to be a change in it, really. And we were in London-centric, so we're supposed to be in the place for it all where it's available. So speaking to people around the country who are in other hospitals, there is less of it there. Mm. So having witnessed it first time what's in London is completely different to what I believe, what I've been told from the other areas, but... On the whole, it's just an experience that you're not signed up to as a parent. Sure. And nobody, obviously, would ever, ever, ever want to be, but there'll be many people listening who maybe have gone through something similar, maybe going through it right now. If you'd like to talk to Kerry, we'll be taking your calls a little bit later, 0345 6060 973. We'll also be talking to his MP, Sir Oliver Heald, who's... I've never had an MP stay silent for 10 minutes in the <laughs> studio before, Oliver, so well That's done for that. But we will come to you in just a couple of minutes' time. You're listening to LBC. It's 19 minutes past nine. This is LBC.
Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It's 21 minutes past nine on LBC. Kerry Menai Davis is with us, whose son, he died almost exactly two years ago, age six, from a rare form of cancer. You've just heard him explain uh, the circumstances, how it affected him, his wife, his family. And um, he's now started up a new charity with, I think, a really good title actually yeah. sort of it, it's it's never you well it, it sometimes is and when i think when anything bad ever happens to us we think well why why has it happened to us and it's quite i think a lot of people struggle to understand sometimes and i mean there's nothing wrong with with having that struggle but often there aren't the support mechanisms to help someone understand so kerry you were explaining that you then emailed your mp Swallow of a heel. Now, what, what was that? Why did you do that? Because um, I remember sitting at home and just thinking, we need to make a change. Something needs to change. How do you do it? Um, so I emailed Sir Oliver. Um, he kindly emailed, I think it was around Christmas time, I think he kindly emailed me back. We arranged a Zoom call quite quickly and I explained to him what we were going through and what we went through. Um, it was quite raw for me still at that point, so emotions were high um, with me and, um, and my wife as well. And, uh, yeah, I just said, and, and Sir Oliver kindly invited me into the House of Commons and I met Edward Arga, MP. He's uh, a health minister, isn't he? Health. Yeah. And then um, we met him, we described and we discussed about the bereavement support, the lack of food available, and he sent us a, an excellent response back. And then uh, it came to another thing that we, we were talked about all the time was the lack of financial support for parents in hospital. We researched it. I researched it endlessly. Um, and... I was chatting to a friend of mine and we had this um, idea that, you know, it is true, and I, I said to your researcher that, that morning, there's a discrimination we feel between bringing a child into the world and having a child leave the world. Uh, if you're to bring a child into the world, you're the, the, the mother or the uh, um, is brought covered with maternity pay, they can go back to their same job, they can... Um, take time off there's a new neonatal bill just been passed as well so they can take more time off paid if the baby's premature and also you get paternity leave as well for two weeks um, which the father's entitled to or the partner's entitled to but if you have a child that's dying or seriously ill there was nothing that you're entitled to apart from universal credit which was means tested disability living allowance which in some respects some of the parents who phone up might say that you're kind of told to overplay it um, to give the worst possible scenario. And I, I would not ever write that she wasn't aimed to cure on the on the sheets because I just didn't feel that was... I, I couldn't get myself to write that. And then you're entitled to carer's allowance once you get disability living allowance. And then the other side of it is you're entitled to 18 weeks unpaid leave through the year in four-week chunks. But that doesn't cover if you're self-employed. So if you're self-employed or you're a parent that has a... Um, a sick child, you tend to find that one of them, one of the parents, or if you're a single parent, has to be the full-time caregiver. So that, that leads them to spend the extended time in hospital um, with the child. They also might have siblings at home. But it also means that there's a 50% reduction if you're a, a, a two-parent family of income into the house. And aside with that, looking after a sick child incurs extra costs. So, for example, when Hugh is having chemotherapy, do you know, the taste change of a child, have someone having chemotherapy, they don't want to eat the right things that they normally eat, the tastes are intensified, so Hugh would be having chemo in hospital, and um, he'd say, Daddy, I fancy a jam donut. All right, Hugh, I'll go and get one, I'll, I'll walk to the shop and get one. Oh, I don't like that, have a little bit nibble of it, oh, I don't like that one. Daddy, I want jelly babies. Oh, I'll go and get some jelly babies. And you spent £50 by the end of the day, and all the food's just stacked up there, and I was tending to eat anyway, and bloomed up, and I, did, I felt awful eating it all. But then, you, but you would do anything for your child at the time. Like if you asked me to go to Mars to get Moon Mars right, I'd have found some way to get there. Do you know, you just do anything. But I was in a fortunate position where I was okay financially because um, I had the supportive business and family. But I saw parents, or witness parents, in there that didn't have that thing, and um, and I found that really hard to watch because there's not only were they suffering with the anxiety of looking after a really sick child but also they got the the bad and the anxious time of worrying how they're going to pay their bills how they're going to go home and drive home where's the money to that they've got to take public transport with a, a sick child during covid mm. on a bus and there's i remember watching one lady and um i was in a, at a day unit in edinburgh with with hugh and she had an 11 year old having chemotherapy for leukemia she had and two younger children with her and she left the 11-year-old in bed to go home and take the other two children home and buy a bus. And I thought, oh, 
I actually paid for a taxi to take her home um, and bought some food. But I just thought that was, it's, it's not right in that sense. I didn't think that was the added burden of looking after that sick child and then worrying about that. She's obviously on her own. And uh, I just felt that was um, not right. So that's why I, I, I contacted Sir Oliver to do that and change, try and make a change for that. Well, Oliver, let's bring you into the conversation. I mean, you, you as a constituency MP will be, will have letters and emails all the time from people who want something, who want the law to change in some way. Now, you've gone the ultimate mile on this and you, you're actually introducing a bill. I think it's been printed today. Yes. What struck you about what Kerry, I mean, apart from the sort of emotional side and the natural human empathy that you would have felt, what what made you really take this up as a cause? Well, I thought that uh, Kerry was raising some issues which I hadn't really heard about before, which were really quite detailed ways of improving the experience for parents in hospital during a dreadful ordeal like this. And so when we went to see Ed Arger, uh, Edward Arger, the minister, it wasn't just... Um, you know, generalised comments. I mean, Kerry was able to point to particular things he wanted to change. And um, Edward Argus put him in, in, in touch with um, the team who are building the new children's hospital at Cambridge. And they've actually said that they found what Kerry said, you know, his, in, his, his intuitions about and insights about particular um, bits of support, they found it inspiring. And, and so they are going to be doing some of the things that Kerry uh, wanted and that's being fed into the new schools, uh, new um, children's hospitals program. So, I mean, that's great. But this issue of money, I mean, I hadn't, I was aware that there were benefits that could be available, but it, it doesn't really cover the situation that Kerry's pointing to where you're either self-employed or your employer will let you take your unpaid leave, but, you know, you're running out of money and all that worry about money mm. when your child's so ill. And, I mean, I think Kerry was, and, and Francis, his wife, were going into the hospital day every day or staying there quite often mm. in a flat at, at the Cambridge Hospital and, uh, you know, money dwindling uh, badly. So that's what we're trying to do. And what we're, what we're saying to the government is, look, we want you to report on how you could improve this um, and also to take... You know, proper consultations with parents and groups who would know about this uh, so that we get a, a, a good scheme. I mean, I'm thinking of something a bit like furlough, uh, where you, you get your uh, income supported. Uh, or, or you could also do a grant scheme, as we did for the self-employed during uh, COVID. But it does need something. And so that's what we're doing. We've printed it today. Uh, we will need to debate it. And, and, of course, that's we're towards the end of the session. So if we don't get it through this parliamentary session, I'll be pressing for something like this in the King's speech, which is in November. And then um, if, if that doesn't happen, we'll push for it as a private member's bill. In the, in the next session, the last session before uh, the election. So we'll, um, you know, we're going to uh, keep pushing this. So in in terms of money that it would cost the church, because I mean the Treasury yes. are, are usually the, the roadblock to reform in these things, aren't they? Because they have to come up with the extra money or I suppose it could be found within the Department yeah. of Health ex uh, budget. I mean, this is not something that would um, cost sort of billions of pounds because no. I mean by definition there, there are a limited number of people thank goodness going through this at any one time. I, I've asked a, a set of parliamentary questions about this and th there are about 4,000 children who spend uh, two months or more um, in hospital continuously each year so actually that, if you think about the sort of grants you might give i mean that's not a huge amount of money it's um it, it's manageable and uh, it would make such a big difference you know to a group of people who are really really suffering so i think it's a good thing to do and um we're going to push it hard i mean you, you've been in parliament quite a long time well how do you rate your chances of success here well i've taken two bills through to to become acts of parliament as a private member most recently in about 2019 and you do need to be persistent persuasive and uh, so on but um, I, I'm I'm reasonably confident about this I mean I've got some heavyweight support 
across the parties. Um, you know, Dame Margaret Beckett's a, a supporter of this. Oh, she's on your side, you're guaranteed to. Well, it's a strong, it's a strong <laughs> suit, isn't it? Valerie Vaz, who used to be the you know leader, a shadow leader in yep. the House of Commons, Labour. And, and several other Labour members, and then I've got uh, a whole bevy of, um, of of conservatives who are well thought of. I mean, Dr. Caroline Johnson is a consultant paediatrician, so um, she's uh, obviously a good person to understand the issue, and she's supporting me. So, you know, I've got some heavyweight support, uh, and I think we can push it through. Were you involved in the world of politics before this? No, I quite like the idea of doing something in the future. Do I turned you? 40 in April, <laughs> and uh, I, I actually emailed Sir Oliver. I said, do you know what? I watched him in Parliament when he read the bill out, um, and I was, well, my wife, was, I was just a bit taken back by it, really, and I was thought, do you know what? And I, I listened to some politicians talk about why they went into it, and then you don't realise, if you want to make a change, which I want to do, you need to work your way to get to make a change, and you don't make a change just sitting in your bedroom at home thinking the world's not a great place for you. You've got to get out and make a change yourself. And so rather than um, wallowing the misery that people would expect that my wife and I would be after losing Hugh, we decided to get up and not turn pain into purpose. And so as I, hence I emailed you several times and you can tell I'm persistent, um, which is, I suppose, a good thing really when it comes to this. But yeah, yeah I, I, I would love the idea of it. Well, I think it's a, an object lesson that if you want to make a change, there are ways of doing it. Not everyone will be successful. I, I can't sit here, and I'm sure you can't either, Oliver, and say, well, I can guarantee you that no. within two years all of this will have been implemented. No. But you're clearly going to have a damn good go at it. Yeah. And hopefully a lot of people who are listening to this programme now will, will throw their support behind you as well. Well, we're going to take some calls in a moment, 0345 6060 973, if you'd like to talk to Kerry and to Oliver. Uh, it's 9.32. Let's get the latest news headlines with Tim Daly. President Biden could be facing an impeachment inquiry over his family's business dealings. The Speaker of the US House, Kevin McCarthy, is directing committees to open a formal investigation. People in the Libyan city of Derna are saying a quarter of it has been destroyed after a powerful storm and flooding. 2,200 people are now believed to be dead and more than 10,000 could be missing. And the chief executive of BP, Bernard Looney, has resigned with immediate effect after controversy about relationships with colleagues. The 53-year-old joined the company in February 2020, promising to make it carbon neutral by the middle of the century. LBC weather becoming largely dry tonight as rain in eastern England moves away. A largely dry and clear night for the rest of the UK with lows of 4 degrees. This is LBC.
Ian Dale on LBC. 9.36 on LBC. We have with us uh, Kerry Menai Davis, who doesn't sound very Welsh, but presumably you've got Welsh antecedents there. I have, my mum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Sir Oliver Heald, who is his local MP. You've heard the story. Um, I think a lot of us will have found it incredibly, well, and everybody listening, I'm sure, will have found it incredibly moving. So we want to go to calls now, and it's really if you've got any questions that you want to ask either Kerry or Oliver, but also give your own experiences, because I suspect there will be people listening who've been some, through something equally horrible and horrendous um, and it, you may want to just bring and tell us about it. Uh, let's go to Josh who's a first time caller in Ipswich. Hi Josh. Hi, uh, good evening. What would you like to say? Uh, just uh, firstly uh, Kerry, I think you would be really really proud of you with what you're doing and how you're trying to change this country and its perception on this awful subject. Thank you. Appreciate it, Josh. So, um, yeah, my li my little girl in September, she was 19 months. She got diagnosed with leukaemia on the Monday, and then on the Friday she suffered two cardiac arrests, the first one in my arms and then the second one with me and my wife present. Very, very lucky that it was shift handover time and there was a team there. We then spent 60 days in hospital, so... The hospital is about 90 miles round trip away from my home and probably the same from my work. So trying to navigate 60 days of when my life has been turned upside down, my family's life has been turned upside down, trying to be a husband, trying to be a dad in that situation, we've basically just the people in the same situation as you with no proper guidance or no, no actual plan of help if you could help the parents let alone help the child it something really needs to be brought to the public and shown that it isn't quite right i i totally agree josh and that's the first thing i said to fran as i said to you as we we followed you was just do you know what we were on our own and um if anything that we can do is just shine a light and help someone like yourself and the many other families out there just to show that there's um, uh, someone that you can just even not even, I'm not talking to myself, just to look up to and say, you know you can get through a really bad time no matter how hard it gets, um, because I looked up to someone, tried to find someone who could do that and you know, as much as you're going through such a, a really bad time right now and it's tough, no, no lies, it's tough but, you know, um, you're in the best hands in the hostels there, the staff do look after your children amazingly well and, um you know, we can reach out to charities as my as our one, and there's a community of parents that we put in touch with parents like yourself that they can talk to. Um, only us as parents who have a sick child can explain the feelings that you're going through, and I can understand every feeling and emotion that you're going through in your voice. Um, and hopefully, with the workers we're doing with Sir Oliver Hield and everyone else, we'll get a change and we'll make a change because I think it's only fair that we give parents a a change to to make it better for them. What was your yeah. biggest, during that 60 days, Josh, what was your biggest challenge? I mean, apart from trying to care for your little girl, what what was there in the background? Sort of, I, I don't know if you've got other, other children that, that you obviously have a responsibility to as well. Did you get any support at all from, from outside? So, um, yeah, I have two other daughters. Uh, they're much older. I've got a 15-year-old a and a 12-year-old. We're very lucky that I have what I call a village around me. So my family, my wife's family had the goals. The biggest, the biggest, hardest thing for me as a man, as a dad, as a husband is I couldn't split myself. I couldn't split myself between my wife needing me because she was sleeping next to at his side. I couldn't split myself to being a dad. I couldn't split myself to me concentrating on my job. So it's just the day-to-day -day things that you think are so normal, like having dinner with your wife or dinner with your family. You couldn't eat in the room because your child was so poorly, but then you didn't want to leave the room and go and have tea because you didn't want to leave them because at that point anything could happen. It's the lack of control and you physically thinking to yourself, I'm not coping with this, but so many people need me to cope with this. It's, it's the relentlessness of it, Josh, I remember. It's, it's never-ending. You think you're winning one moment, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call to say he's got a temperature and you're in. 
And it's also, yeah. I don't know about you, but I found it easier for me to be in hospital with him, closer to him, because I felt like I could almost speak, see that he was being looked after rather than being at a distance. So it was hard for me. I had to separate myself from work like you are. So sort of, I found it easier to be in hospital with him because I was worried when I was out of hospital. Um, yeah, the, the drive the drive to the hospital was the most calming drive because I knew I was going to see my wife, I was going to see Etta, I was going to go there. I know Etta would, would feel a lot better because she had her, her you know, her mum and papa with her and stuff like that. So it was always... I never wanted to be away from the hospital, but I never really wanted... There were certain times when things were so bad, it was just like, I don't want to be here, but I can't leave you. Mm. Josh, thank you very much. Uh, I've got so many calls coming in, and I'm conscious that we've only got 18 minutes left in this hour, so um, I think we could probably talk to you for those 18 minutes, but I hope you won't mind if I move on uh, now. Thank you very much. Just before I move on to the next call, though, we should mention it is Childhood Cancer Month yep. this month, and, and cancer is still one of those things that I think people still don't really talk about it enough. And you were saying to me in the break there that... Um, that there hasn't been a huge amount of media uptake on this, which I'm, I have to say I find quite well, surprising. Um, childhood, childhood cancer is the biggest killer of children outside of road traffic accidents in the UK. Uh, 2,000 children a year get diagnosed with cancer, and sadly up to 200 children a year lose their life from it. Um, the majority of the time the children are fine with it, but obviously it's devastating for life, for the, for the children, and also for the family, for the emotional toll that takes them through. And also, it's one of those things that, as a parent, you don't sign up, you don't think it's going to happen to you. And that's obviously the words, it's never you. Um, but it's one of those taboo subjects as a parent, because I know if you were doing a radio phone <laughs> about childhood cancer, I'd turn it off, because I didn't want to think about it. Because it is obviously the worst nightmare mm. you can ever imagine. And it's stuff... This is why you didn't say that in your email to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, but it's one of those things that you think, it's never going to happen to you. So things you yeah. read about in papers, and um, obviously it's prevalent and it's there, and it needs to be talked about, really. And how can people donate to your charity? Um, oh, we've got a new website, which is launched today. It's, it's neveryou.com. We have a donate page on there. But obviously we want people to do things to donate, like marathons and runs and hikes and cakes and everything like that. I can't promise that. <laughs> I'll try and do something for you, but I can't promise a marathon. <laughs> Golf event. Yeah, let's do a golf event. That's <laughs> yeah. a good idea. I can, yeah. I can do that. Um, right, we will come to another call in just a few moments' time. It's 9.45. Coming up at 10 on LBC, Ben Kentish. A former Conservative Party leader calls on the government to look at the triple lock on pensions, saying we simply can't afford it. He's right, isn't he? Ben Kentish on LBC. The Fiat.
Gale. Text 84850. This is LBC. Let's go to Scott, who's a first-time caller in Clacton. Hello, Scott. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Hi. What would you like to say? Uh, yeah, so um, we um, we sadly lost our um, son. Uh, he was uh, three um, to leukaemia T-cell uh, last October. He um, Last year he got diagnosed in January uh, and then sadly we, we lost him in in October um, and j- just um, listening to the stories and stuff like that, just the anxiety and the the pressure these parents and what we had were, is tremendous like you get thrown into a world that where you are not just a parent you are now doctor, carer uh, logistics you know um, you, you are split into two different worlds, the normal world where you are trying to work and and pay bills and, and you know, the normal stuff. And then you are thrown into this other world with hospitals and NG tubes, uh, tubes coming out of the noses and into the stomach and, and Hickman lines, all these all these things that you didn't even know existed until you get thrown into it. Um, and you are, you know, you're, you're, you're just thrown in and you, you have to live these two lives merging them together as well. Um, I've got an older son as well, so you're trying to find the balance between dropping him to school, you know, you're telling them that you're going to pick him up and then suddenly there's a temperature, so you're all then rushed into hospital, so you, you're trying to figure out how, you know, then to, to work that life as well with, with, you know, all the other normal stuff on top of that as well. So um, anyone that's going through this or... or you know, has gone through this or anything like that. Like, um, you got to take your hat off to them, and they're, they're just, uh, you know, they're just really strong parents out of it as well. And whatever the outcome is. But I, to- hi Scott, you're right, it's Kerry. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I'm sorry to hear about your um, your son. Um, and like, so obviously you're in the same boat that I was in, and trying to deal with everything that's going on right now, and it's. It's a emotional whirlpool, I can imagine, right now. And obviously, you're a, sh- a strong man as well for getting on the on the phone tonight and phoning in and telling the story. Um, yeah. But like you say, hopefully, um, as you say, we need to make a, a change wholesale about how we're looked after as parents, because um, we need to be stronger. And as, as strong as we are, I think there's always room for us to have some more help to help us. Um, yeah, and that's definitely. So, like, uh, um, when he relapsed, we were looking to get him to transplant. That was one of the, the hopefully, was one of the things that would, would help him to survive the leukemia. But um, uh, on that no, you know, I knew I was going to have to still be paying my mortgage. Why, you know, you have to you have to move away to, to have all this stuff done. Uh, I rang my bank and asked if they could help and support with me, whether it was a mortgage break or anything along those lines, trying to be proactive, and they just couldn't do it. They just said they, there was not nothing they could do. What they actually advised was to stop paying my, my mortgage, which would obviously just ruin my credit rate and, and put us into more trouble. So just some, like, also big, you know, when people are trying to be proactive and trying to do the right thing, you know, these these other big organisations and have this bill will help that, you know, they need to understand that they need support and they need to support people going through this as well, you know, and, and it's it's little things like that that people don't know about and don't think um, is is a big deal to to people. Obviously, it is, you know, it, it's it, that's a massive thing. So, um, it's just yeah. an added burden that you don't need, isn't it, on top of an already stressful time? Yeah, abs- Scott. Absolutely. Scott, thank you very much indeed. A couple of texts here. Jaya in King's Cross says, is there a monthly subscription to sign up to the charity It's Never You rather than a one-off payment? There is, yeah. There is, you can do that. Somebody's saying the, the donation link doesn't work. Well, it does because I've just tried it. I suspect you may be putting the apostrophe in the it's, so don't do that. It's neveryou.com. Well, it does work. I've just tried there's it. There's a link off our Instagram as well if you find that at its.neveryoucharity there's a link to donate off there excellent well. right let's go to hillary who's in wallingham in sorry hello hillary hello good evening um Hi. first of all kerry i think what you and your family your wife and family are doing is absolutely wonderful Thank my you. story is slightly different from the other callers that that i've heard 
I lost my son, my eldest son, nine years ago. Um, he was 39 and he had a brain tumour. Um, and I'd just like to say that I could never have done what you were doing, but I do my, I do whatever I can now. Um, I volunteer at Cancer UK. I do as much as I can to raise money for this dreadful disease. But the sadness and the loss never go away. And although it's nine years, it seems like yesterday, the pain's always there. But you learn to live with it. And my my way of dealing with it and living with it is the company of wonderful friends who understand and have always been there for me. I have a lovely family. Um, I have grandchildren, so I'm very blessed. And... But again, it, it is the terrible sadness of what Aaron is missing and what the children are missing because he would be so proud of them. And Sorry to hear that. It's, but you're really doing that, him proud that, now. That, that is all I wanted to say is that unless you've been through it, people don't understand. And it's not something that you get over and it's not something that will ever go away because however old they are, they are just your child. Well, Hilary, you said it beautifully, and thank you very much for making that call. Um, Graham's in Doncaster. Hello, Graham. Hi there, Ian. Um, Hi. And Kerry as well. As well. well um, I thought I'd ring in to share my story. Um, I had uh, leukaemia at the, at the age of four in, in 1994, and... Um, um, my local hospital was, um, well, my local children's ward was Sheffield Children's Hospital, which is a good 25 miles away from uh, Doncaster. So I, I've got a bit of a unique perspective, I suppose. I was I was the child in this case, and, you know, it was my, my parents who had to shuttle me back and forth over the course of four years to, um, uh, to Sheffield Children's Hospital to help treat me leukemia uh, my, my parents weren't particularly rich so occasionally they, they actually couldn't afford to, to to come and see me um in hospital so to speak so it's uh yeah there's you know I, it's, it's interesting really because i was um when i when i remember sort of lying there and occasionally you know a, a, a nurse would come to me and say oh really sorry graham your, your parents can't come and see you today because they've got you know they, they couldn't forward to put petrol in the car kind of thing so yeah um it, they you know they always they obviously always tried their best but it was only it was only my father working at the time and you know my, my mother was looking after my younger brother so to speak so um as i as i got older and it you know it, it was still ongoing um you know there were when i was sort of seven or eight i do actually remember uh starting to start to get a little bit lonely especially when you know you, you were an isolated unit, so to speak. So let's say, I, you know, I had leukemia and you're on that um, chemotherapy medication, your body's so, your body's fighting the, you know, the cancer so hard that if you get anything else, so to speak, you know, they have to put you in an isolated ward to protect you from, um, you know, infecting other children, let's say with a cold or, or something like that, because that, that could really, honestly, um, mm. have, have the impact, so to speak. You know, that could, that could finish, finish you off. Um, fortunately, um, my, my parents had the, well, my parents got a bit of support from a, a, a wonderful, wonderful charity called uh, PACT, which is a parents' association for children with tumors and leukemia, uh, and they they still exist to this day, and uh, you know um, have had uh, still have a massive massive impact on 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 the parents of uh, children with, with leukemia and um, and tumors at Sheffield Children's Hospital, and, and their work now is um, to to support the parents like they supported by my mother and father, so to speak, with. Um, uh, with like communicating things to me when I was um, in hospital, and also, you know, they 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 just set up groups as well, so uh, my mother could discuss what was going off with me, etc. You know, and that that being able to talk about it and share the share it with other parents is is, is such an important thing. Um, they now um, own um, 
house called Packed House, which is just outside of Sheffield Children's Hospital. And um, because we've lost a lot of children's units in the north of England, um, you know, we're now getting a situation where parents have to travel up to 90 miles to get to... You know, a 90-mile trip one way to get to Sheffield Children's Hospital to, to see the kids. So and That, and that, that really sh- should not be the case. Graeme, listen, we're, we're reaching the end of the show, so I'm, I'm going to have to end it there, but thank you so much, because you've, you've offered a, a different perspective. Um, Oliver, that, that, that seems mad, that the, the, the people have to travel so far to get to a children's centre, but that's not, not, not the only place in the country. Well, we, we do need a new generation of children's hospitals, and of course they're being planned like the one in Cambridge, and I think that is very important. And the thing that uh, Kerry's been able to give to this is the parents' perspective. So I'm hoping that when these hospitals are built, um, you know, we will have proper facilities and outreach for the parents in the way we haven't previously. in In a very short time, you've achieved a hell of a lot. I'm sure he would be proud of you. It's obviously going to be a very emotional week or two, given it's the anniversary of his death coming up. But I think everybody listening will just say, well, all power to your elbow, because you're doing you're doing something fantastic here. The fact that you've got Oliver to present this bill, and good luck with that. Hopefully it will go through. And I have to say, sort of anything I can do, I will happily help you with. So thank you, thank you very much for coming thank and spending the hour with us.